Good morning, everybody. Woo, getting a little bit of weather this morning. It's all right. Nice hot cup of coffee. Come on, let's get this day out right. Be fun. Try to stay as dry as we can. Welcome back, everybody, and uh, another stick shift. As you can see, got a little bit more rain in Los Angeles, but it's all right. Nothing, uh, a little bit of rain gear can't help. A nice hot cup of coffee. Starting out with the 737, this one had just come up from the hangar because it overnighted last night. So I just do a quick little walk around, make sure everything's A-OK. -okay. Trying to stay as dry as possible, but I just want to make sure everything is good to go. I don't want those uh, last minute gate calls. may have mentioned this before, but it's okay for a review. You see that little cable right there? That's called a retention cable. It connects both the brakes together. So imagine if one of those wheels falls off, this cable will prevent the brake from sliding off and falling off as well. I know the whole incident with United is still a little fresh with the 777 losing its wheel, but anyway, this is on a 737. This prevents the, the brakes from falling off. Anyway, <laughs> retention cable, that's what it's there for. Well, let's go. Let's see what we're working with. show you a cool little function on a 737 seats uh, actually all major aircraft seats have this this little lever this is a locking mechanism for the shoulder harness seats inside the flight deck have a five-point harness kind of like a race car the shoulder harness works exactly like the seat belt in your car it has an inertia reel so if you tug on it really quick it will stop but right here you have an extra feature a locking mechanism so if the pilot straps in and they are comfortable where they are they can simply lock the shoulder harness now you're going to ask yourself, well, if there's an inertia reel, why would you need that? That's silly. The reasoning behind this is, let's say you have very severe turbulence or very, you know, heavy movements within the aircraft when it's flying, not enough to activate the inertia reel. The pilot doesn't want to be bouncing up and down in their seat. So they will lock out the shoulder harness, keep them nice and steady and sitting in one place. Also it helps if you go inverted. Yeah. <laughs> you basically stay in your seat. The shoulder harness won't allow you to move, but... Yeah, that's what it's there for, to lock out the shoulder harness. So let's take a look at the yoke or the control column. The obvious autopilot disengage is pretty much self-explanatory. Two switches right there on the left-hand side of the column is for the stab trim. You can adjust the horizontal stabilizer like that. And you can also do it via manually like this with the wheel. That little handle is better known as the kneecap smasher. So the way this works is that pilots can control the horizontal stabilizer trimming manually via that handle that you saw, or they can do it via the trim switches, which is an electrical function. This is what it looks like when you pop out that little handle, and when you hit that, you know, the trim switches, this wheel is going to start spinning. This is why I call it the, the kneecap smasher, because if you have your knees out and you're sitting in the place right there, as soon as you hit it, smack, yeah, it hurts like heck. So what this thing is actually moving is a jack screw in the tail of the airplane. There's also a thing called a stab cutout switch, which I'll talk about in a later video. Matter of fact, let me show you what the jack screw looks like on the 737. Here you go. Don't mind the silly man with the hat, but that's the jack screw right there. That's what actually moves up and down and moves the horizontal stabilizer for trim. All this place, the hell hole, because it gets super hot in the summers, the APU is literally right behind that compartment. And that's the APU fire bottle you saw there. APU fuel shroud. I've talked about that before. The pilot and the autopilot can't control the horizontal stabilizer or the trim motor. The way this works is that the jack screw gearbox receives input from the stabilizer manual trim or, you know, the switches or the, the crank, the handle. That happens, the trim wheel cables turn the aft cable drum, that drum that you're seeing right there. That's turning, their gearbox turns, making the jack screw go up and down. Remember, this aircraft is still a conventional direct control, so all you get is cables and pulleys. Most of the flight controls are cable driven, but hydraulically assisted. As you can see, it just gets routed throughout the whole aircraft, and there's a nice look for you to the aft pressure bulkhead. And another little quick view of the jack screw, and that's about it. Back to the yoke or the control wheel. This is the control wheel PTT, push to talk. There's three settings on this. It's defaulted to off, which is in the center. So when you press up, you're engaging the mic or the microphone. This is the push to talk signals that go to the communication systems, basically the radios. When you press down, you see it says INT. This is microphone that goes to the flight interphone system, so known as cabin intercommunication. It allows the flight crew to talk to the cabin crew and personnel outside if they're plugged in. That thing is just a little adjustable clipboard. Inside of the yoke, you'll see these little dials. This is usually used for setting the flight number. I think pilots also use that to set a frequency or to remember a frequency. Those are aileron trim markings. It looks exactly the same way as it is on a 777. Pretty cool. 
So a quick little reference back to that clipboard I was showing you on the control column. Well, in the older 737s, that clipboard actually had the checklist. And the majority of 737s still have it there. Now, this is an extra function that they can buy from Boeing. Obviously, my carrier has it. They put the checklist down here. They call this a mechanical checklist. It is not connected to anything at all. It's simply a little box with lights. It's a nice little helpful unit to the pilots for a checklist. What you see me doing here is performing an engine and APU fire test. Everybody does this prior to starting the APU and prior to starting the engines. It ensures that the system is working properly as well as the squibs are working properly. Got done with that 737 and now a beautiful 777 is coming in. On to the next office. Just like any other aircraft, we do our preliminary walk around, making sure all the brakes and tires are good, making sure all the big pieces are hanging, just making sure the general condition of the aircraft is A-OK. -okay. I think somebody asked me one time, how are you going to figure out if there's a leak or not? The good old smell test. So the water on the ground will get discolored or has a, some kind of a tint to it. <laughs> it right here let's talk about tires you see that little green mark and there's also a little circle around there they're all around the circumference of the tire their names are all vents a w l these little vents are holes that are made during manufacturing of the tire what these vents will do is allow air to escape the casing of the tire during manufacturing process it's there to prevent any kind of bulges or ply separation there's another important mark right here, the red dot right there. This is known as a balance mark. It is always aligned with the valve stem. Aircraft tires and wheels are balanced exactly like car tires. If you have an imbalance, you're going to have vibration. It will distribute certain balance weights across the wheel assembly to make sure that the tire is in balance. The only difference between automotive and aviation tires and wheels is that the tire and the wheel assembly are balanced separately. Heavy spot of the wheel is aligned with the light spot of the tire. I'm talking about the wheel, I mean the wheel assembly, the rim. The tire and the rim is two separate things, but all together, we call this a wheel assembly. One interesting thing about this mark, you could actually use it as another source of information for a anti-slippage mark. It's not officially designated for that, but it's a good way to look at a tire and a rim and making sure that the tire has not slipped from the rim assembly. Basically, if I see that mark away from the valve stem, I know that tire has slipped which would cause me to change the tire. Dunlop does a really good job explaining this on their website. Well, this one just came in from Sydney and it's going right back out to Miami, but it's got a couple of write-ups, nothing too big. We'll go check it out. So I didn't get a chance to film it, but the problem was the first officer's chair, the electrics went down. It basically was not moving electrically. They can still move the chair manually, it's not a problem, but I have to deactivate the electrics, which means I have to pull a circuit breaker and collar it. 
we put this on MEL, minimum equipment list, which is all legal. And you get a good view of the equipment bay on the 777. Anyway, on to the next one. Let's go. Back to the 737. <laughs> it came in with a clogged sink. It's all right. Already fixed that. That was easy. So that's it right here. Let's take a look what's underneath. The lavatories underneath your sink, you have a water heater, drain lines that go overboard. You have a trash chute and you have this little green thing. This is called the lavatory fire extinguishing system. And that little green bottle is a fire extinguisher. This little bottle has two discharge ports. There's a nozzle that's pointing down into the trash compartment. In case the temperature within the trash compartment reaches to a certain level, these little plugs will melt. Once they melt, they will release the extinguishing agent into that trash compartment to put out any kind of fire. That's it. Okay, clog is fixed. Let me see now. Have I ever shown you guys the spare bulb kit on the 737? It's right here. There you go. Pretty much all major aircraft have spare bulb kits, just in case. Overall, she's a good bird, good to fly. It's still raining outside though. Ooh. I don't think it's gonna stop today. Anyway, on to the next one. Next office, check this out. This is gonna be a real tight turn right here. Alrighty, this one just got here, but it's actually gonna get repositioned. Came into international gate, but it's gonna get repositioned to uh, to domestic. So just gotta get it ready. Give it a little bit of oil, and there was a little write up. I said the seat cushion needed to be changed. I guess it was uncomfortable. That's easy to do. I just gotta pull that up. We'll get a new part number. No worries. We got time. We don't need that on, and we don't need that on anymore. There you go, that's your old one. Comes off real easy. That's what it looks like underneath the seat cushion here. And that's the little, that's the box for the control mechanism. These seats are actually super easy to change. Don't worry, I know you saw it too, the cap was loose. I tightened it up when I reinstalled the new seat cushion. But since we're here and I told you that the seat is actually very easy to change, here's an old video that I'm gonna show you on how I actually change it. It's a time lapse, so enjoy. Well, most of it is a time lapse. <laughs> anyway, uh, this is a 320 family aircraft and this is the captain's chair and the seat electrics went down. We had the seat in stock and might as well change it out. It takes eight bolts all around and there's also a cannon plug. There's an electrical connector that goes down into the equipment bay. And right here, you also have to take apart the armrest in order to get the seat actually out of the flight deck. Here's what it looks like without the seat there and the hole is where the electrical connector will go down anyway we get the new seat in and funny the pilots over there were sitting and watching us they always like uh, and enjoy watching maintenance work because they never get to see this kind of stuff so it's cool to share with them after reinstalling the electrical connector from downstairs and tightening all the bolts and then torquing them down simply perform an operational check which is you know going up and down and the functionality of the seat And here we go, that's the functional check. Just making sure all the seat functions are working. All is good, pilot was happy, we were happy. No delay, airplane went out safe. Now back to the seat cushion, remember that one? There you go. New cushion. All righty, here's the new one. Just set this through and put this through there. Easy. And there's your final product. It's all just held on by a Velcro. Good. 
All right, on to the next one. Well, it started raining again, and then it stopped, and started, and then it stopped again. <laughs> this weather can't make up its mind, but check it out. Look what came in. That's pretty cool. The, ga the Allegheny bird. That thing looks nice. So this one is actually a repaint. So this paint job, the Allegheny, or they call it the heritage paint jobs or liveries. This was actually painted on a 319 prior. There were a bunch of more 319s that were painted like this, like an America West one, a PSA, a Piedmont one. They were all 319s. All those got stripped from their original paint and the heritage paint jobs, they didn't want to lose them. So they repainted them all on beautiful 321s. I still get a little bit melancholy on the America West one. That is my favorite one because originally it was painted on aircraft 838 and now it's on a 321 five something. But anyway, yeah, this is still beautiful. I do love seeing this and I'm glad uh, the carrier is still keeping with up with the tradition and keeping the old paint schemes. Took my lunch break and uh, went out to do a little bit of plane spotting. I rarely get to do this, but it's always fun. It's always beautiful to see the MD-11s landing, and these are beautiful jets. The era of tri-power plant aircraft is slowly coming to an end. Enjoy it while it lasts. This is the beautiful high bypass section on the CFM Leap 1A engine equipped on the 321 Neo. Believe it or not, majority of the thrust comes from here. About 80 to 85% thrust is coming from the high bypass. Just as the majority of the thrust that comes out of the high bypass, anything that gets ingested such as water, guess what? It goes right through the high bypass. Very little of it goes into the core of the engine. And whatever does go into the core of the engine, such as any kind of water, will get atomized and just basically evaporate. It was still raining. It did not stop at all, all throughout the night. But you know what? We're inside the airplane, which is totally cool. I'm staying dry. I'm happy. I want to talk about the Airbus, and I want to talk about the laws of flight on this aircraft and the particular computer systems that actually deal with it. Let's go. On the overhead panel, you're gonna notice certain push buttons. They deal with flight controls. I'm gonna go through them one by one. I'm gonna to try to make it as easy as possible. So number one, ELAC, elevator and aileron computer. This computer is in charge of control of elevators, ailerons, as well as the THS, the Trimble Horizontal Stabilizer Positioning. The aircraft has two of these computers. Number two, the SEC computer spoiler and elevator computers there's three of these notice the intricate redundancy within them that multiple computers control multiple things and number three the fac the fax flight augmentation computer there's two of those so when you combine all of these computers that are controlling the flight control surfaces and the movements of the aircraft you get a very beautiful system as most of you know the airbus family especially the 320 family is divided into three sub hydraulic systems that are independent of each other and these computer systems work hand in hand with the hydraulics. Point I'm trying to make here is that even if one of the systems fail, let's say one of the ELACs or one of the SEX or even one of the hydraulic systems that do fail, you'll still have a backup. It will still be able to control the aircraft. Now, going back to my original thought, the control system of the aircraft, the laws of flight, 
this is the logic of Airbus. You have pretty much four laws. There's a fifth one in the back. I'll show it to you. Normal law, when everything is honky-dory, everything is fine, the computer is literally taking care of everything and everything is functioning normally. By the way, feel free to pause and read these on your own. It's fun. Basically, the aircraft is protecting itself. Next, you have alternate law. Now, the aircraft has lost some of its protection, but it's still capable of flying. No problem at all. Might need a little bit of input from the pilot, but it can still manage. Guys, as a side note, I'm trying to make it as simple as possible for you to understand how this works. There's so much more that goes behind the computer systems and all the logic. This is where it gets a little bit more serious. Abnormal alternate law. Now you have a lot more input from pilot. Now you're on a cusp of direct law. And what that means is full control. Now in abnormal alternate law, there's still computers that are functioning and still protecting the aircraft from performing any kind of evasive maneuvers or you know, going into some kind of heavy G loads, but it's still degraded. And then you go into a direct law. Direct law is no more computer systems. Now the pilot is in full control. Just to give you guys an understanding of what these laws actually do, and when I keep on saying protection, the protection of the aircraft, it the aircraft will protect itself from abnormal maneuvers. So for example, let's say a pilot decides to go bank angle 45 degrees, right? Left or right, doesn't matter. And the airplane will recognize that in normal law and say to itself, no, I will not allow you to go bank angle 45. I will only give you 20 degrees bank angle. That's about it. I will not allow you to exceed the limitations of the aircraft. That's normal law. As the laws get degraded and go down into this direct version of uh, the simplicity of stick and rudder direct law, then the pilot has full control of the aircraft and he can pretty much do whatever he wants to do. That is what I mean by the protection of the aircraft. Oh, last but not least, uh, the mechanical backup. This is the worst case scenario. And by the way, did you see how many steps you have to actually go through to get to this? You have to have massive failure. Once again, take your time and read through these things. It's very interesting. But in the mechanical backup version, that is it. The, it's pretty much loss of all flight controls. And uh, you only have the horizontal stabilizer doing his job and just some lateral control movements. That's about it. And it's a manual pitch trim movement. But yeah, uh, it's, it's very interesting and very minute detail that Airbus went through when they created the laws of flight for Airbus Logic. And I trust it 100%. This is like a quadruple redundancy system where it's almost basically fail safe. It's a uh, it would take an act of God to basically bring an airplane down with these kind of sophisticated systems or human error, obviously, but you get my point. We're taking a look at the thrust quadrant on the Airbus 321 right here, and most pilots already are familiar with this. The numbers that you are seeing there are markers for degrees the degrees are there to give you a visual cue of how many degrees the thrust column or the levers are being pushed forward there's a variety of detents that are on these thrust levers obviously you have the thrust reversers when you pull that up the thrust column will go full back and put the aircraft in thrust reverse then you have climb up next you have maximum continuous thrust or flex takeoff and at the very end you have toga takeoff or go around don't worry about me moving these things around. Remember, it's a fly-by-wire aircraft. No effects. Looks like it's still wet out there, but it's okay. This is the last flight of the night. Came in, it's gonna go back out later on tonight. I can't remember who was asking me. They said, the question was, what's below the integrated standby instrument sir, uh, unit right here? Right, this thing right here. It's the ADSB. I've talked about the ADSB before. You guys can look that up. And right below that is the, the data link control unit. Or uh, the pilots can also use it for their CPDLC. Uh, CPDLC, Controller Pilot Data Link Communication. It's basically a fancy text messaging service between the controller and the pilot and ATC. They can contact ATC and they can also contact company. It's basically a messaging service. So they can talk to ATC and they can talk to company. That's pretty cool. Anyway, hope you guys had fun today. I will see you bright and early in the morning. Don't forget the coffee. Later.
Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another beautiful day. Let's go. Here comes the first office. Welcome to the next day. Check this out. I want to show you something really cool right here. Do you see that right there? That little red dot. That is called a delta P or a differential pressure switch. Right below that is a filter. Aircraft are very sophisticated and these delta P's are basically all over the aircraft on any kind of filtration system. If there was a clog within that filter, that little red dot would pop out. It has a setting where there is a pressure differential within the filter because it feels that it is clogged or it knows that it's clogged. The pressure difference will make that little poppet or that little red dot pop out. That will give us an indication that that filter is now clogged. We need to change it out. They are all over the place, as I said before, for hydraulic systems as well as oil systems. The proper name is DPI, Differential Pressure Indicator. This is a cargo door and pretty much any major aircraft that you see will have these little sight glasses. Do you see the little green band in there? I know it's very hard to see because it's foggy, but there is a little indication there. This is a visual indication that the cargo door has been closed and latched properly. There were a few incidents in the past where the cargo doors have blown off the aircraft, but this is why this was invented. This is for the pilots, maintenance and ramp crew. This is a visual cue that we can look at and make sure the cargo door is properly latched and secured. Well, this one's good to go. Matter of fact, the, the same crew that brought it in is taking it right back out. I think this came from Tampa and going out to uh, Phoenix. So yeah, the pilots probably went out there to the terminal to get something neat real quick. But yeah, same crew taking it out. That's pretty cool. All right, on to the next one. Here comes the next office. Come on in, beautiful.
the thing ready to go to London Heathrow, but hydraulics were just a little bit low, so I'm gonna give it a little service. Not a big deal, easy. There it is. Put that latched. This lovely 777 needed some hydraulic servicing. Yes, hydraulics do seep out time to time and we do need to service them. This is why we check all the time. This is the compartment and I'm using a Bowser. We can just hook up to that little um, port over there that I showed you earlier, select the system that I want and easily pump up the fluid. You can also do this in a different method. Do you see that blue hose that's running up across the top? That's for a different style of uh, filling it up. Have a can, put that hose inside of a can that's full of SkyDraw and use that bar on the right side and pump it up manually. But since I got the equipment, the Bowser that has hydraulic fluid and I can pressure fill it like this, it's much easier and cleaner. All right, once hooked up, you select the system that you want, left, center, or right, and you simply pump. And this is SkyDraw. And you watch the gauge. Easy. In case you were curious about the filling instructions and the capacities of the tanks of the left, center, and right system, it's right there. Feel free to pause and look. By the way, that's the area where you would hook up that bar and pump it manually. But there you go, that's about it. Closing back up and good to go. We'll go check it inside the flight deck as well, just to double check. There we go. Alrighty, we checked it downstairs, but we can double check it up here as well. So there's your hydraulic levels. They were a little below the minimum, well, minimum of E-tops. Top's minimum is uh, 0.9, so it was fluctuating between 0.89 and 9, so might as well top it off. Why not? And let's see now. Oh, those aren't faults, by the way. That uh, stands for left and right system card file. Actually tied it to the battery. Let's see now. Here you go. Watch. Abracadabra. Focus, focus. Disappear. Go away. There you go. Cool. Everything else is good to go. This thing is ready to go to London. All right. Now we wait. And of course, before we go, we got to check the fidget spinner. No go item. <laughs> it's working. All right. Let's go. It was nonstop triple sevens on my gate for some reason, but it is what it is. But here comes another one. Another ETOPS check. Back into the cargo. Quick little e top check, make sure everything's okay. <laughs> Walking by, I saw the this light bulb out. But sometimes the little connection is not just half, not really getting this. So, ah, there it is. <laughs> sometimes it doesn't seat all the way. There you go. Just a little push. <laughs> Easy. Anyway, let's keep on trucking. Everything else is looking good up here, or down here, I should say. All right, looks like one of our tire or nose tires was a little low. Let's see, this is the low pressure side. It needs about 200 and 
10 PSI. We're gonna go a little bit above, and then we're gonna service it up. So we attached to the valve stem right there, as you can see. And that's the tire pressure sensor. That's my partner is upstairs reading. And I crank it up, which I already did. I already serviced it. I'm just gonna show you right here. So it's, it needs to be around 2, 205, 210. It was brought up to about 210, so we're good to go here. That's it. Now we'll just take the pressure off. And remember, that, that is nitrogen. So that's it, pretty easy. Not, not too bad. And remember, close the cylinder always. Easy money. That's about it for the night, guys. That was a fun day, fun weekend. I'll see you guys on the next adventure. One more shift, hold on. We got some cars as well, stick around. Hey, we're back. Well, sort of. Yeah, we are back, just for uh, one day. Quick little shift. Nice little eight hour shift. And here comes the first one. This one's looking good. Actually, this one stays here. All I have to do is just oil it, check the parameters, all good to go. Makes me think of something. You know, uh, Airbus has got tray tables and Boeing pilots are out of luck. They got to eat off their lap, except for one pilot in the flight deck of the 777. The observer. The observer gets a, <laughs> gets a tray table. <laughs> Uh, well, one of the observers. I'm not sure if the other one. No, the other one doesn't get one. Only one observer. And a little cup holder, or I don't know, snack holder. Martini holder. <laughs> but yeah. Maybe they all can turn around and eat off the same table. I don't know. But yeah. <laughs> I thought it was funny. Anyway, this one's good. I was going to go to the hangar. On to the next one. As always, cargo never disappoints. <laughs> oh yeah, look at that, it's a nice Tesla truck. You know, laugh, out of all the times, this is probably the first time I'm actually seeing it. I'm sure they're all over the roads, but this is the first time I'm actually seeing it in real life. I was just seeing it in videos. <laughs> this thing is bigger than I thought. It's genuinely bigger than I thought. I'm sure most people have already seen it. Oh yeah, that's nice. Nice condor over there. But yeah, that's pretty cool. Straight out of, uh, looks, it reminds me of um, Blade Runner. That's what it reminds me of. Very nice. I know most people don't find this uh, vehicle attractive or any kind of aesthetically pleasing. I mean, I don't know. I, I guess I could agree. I'm not biased towards it. It's a, it's a unique vehicle. I mean, I've heard it called a doorstop before too, but I don't know. I just kind of like it for some reason. I mean, it's, it's very unique. I would definitely never own one because I personally could never afford one, but that is the biggest windshield wiper I have ever seen in my life. What the heck? We got something really special. Check this out. What is this? I've never seen this. 
Whatever it is, it's very fancy. Ah, it's a Jag. It's a Jag. Very cool. Very, very cool. It's in really nice condition. And right next to it, a lovely Porsche. Nice. Can never go wrong with a Porsche. They got another one that's covered up over here, but what I saw here was really, really cool. This thing. What the heck is this? Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I've never even heard of this. I'm not even gonna attempt to pronounce that. It looks awesome. Look at the shape and the lines on this thing. Never seen an SUV like this. Or an off-road vehicle. I don't know. Assuming it's electric. That's what I'm going to assume. Looks like an electric vehicle. Crazy. Man, look at that undercarriage. Very impressive going to attempt a name Resvani I think that's how you say it and no it's not an electric vehicle I made a false statement I was just assuming I saw the exhaust pipe afterwards but yeah this thing apparently I read up on it it's supposed to be some kind of an armored vehicle for civilians apparently whoever has a lot of money that can afford a SUV on a Jeep chassis can buy one of these and this thing costs close to two hundred thousand dollars okay i mean sure why not there you go nice screensaver for you count it with me one flying building two flying building three flying building four flying building and there's a fifth one over there there's five eight three eighties right now Next office, back to the Plastic Princess. Ooh she looks beautiful. Not a very exciting day today, but it's all good. So far, so good. No issues, no problems. This one's going out to Haneda. This thing is clean too. Must be one of our new ones. Let's see what we got. I'm gonna brighten these screens up. Okay, well, honestly, we actually cannot finish this on my shift because this thing leaves at around like 1.30 in the morning. So night shift is gonna take over on this one. But we just did a preliminary, so all is good. We'll hand it over to the next shift, let them finish it up. And this is going to be the last flight of the day. Yeah, told you guys, an easy day. Hope you guys had fun. So we saw pretty cool cars. Excuse you, we're speaking here. <laughs> anyway, hope you guys had fun. Thank you for watching, and I'll uh, see you guys back here on Friday. Later!
I think that's about it, guys. Uh, this wraps up for this weekend shift and plus the little extra shift that I worked. I hope you guys have been enjoying this. Uh, I know it wasn't very exciting, but, you know, I try to fill in as much information as I can with the aircraft systems. But, yeah, thank you so much, everybody. I appreciate every single one of you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for watching, taking your time to watch and ask questions. I love answering your questions. And, um... Next week, I'll be in Chicago, and um, I will be doing uh, the competition, as I've spoken before, and I'll document all of that, and I'll get you guys all that wonderful footage. Uh, stay tuned. Thank you all. Take care of yourselves. I'll see you on the next adventure. Later.